Hey everyone. Uh, so welcome to the workshop. My name is Alex Waite. I'm the creative lead here at the Academy. Uh, this is Chris French. He is the lighting and technical lead. And Dylan Neal, uh, effects lead. Hey guys. Hey everyone. Hey everyone. Okay, so what I might do, I'll just share my screen again. Thanks everyone for joining us. We will be going over, um, you know, things to do on your portfolio, how to apply best practices for industry and how to get into the MAV and hopefully answer a bunch of questions for everyone as well. Uh, but before we kick off, what I might do is I'm going to, we'll go over it just a few minutes to describe uh, what the MAV, MAV is, uh, what we do. Uh, I keep saying MAV, I know it's, sorry, uh, it's a Master of Animation and Visualization. And uh, we'll just go over that quickly and then we'll get into the um, portfolio and real work. So here we go. Uh, there are, there's us again. <laughs> Great photos and um, uh, our names as well, in case anyone forgot in the last few seconds. Uh, all right, before starting, uh, I would like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Aura, Aura Nation upon whose ancestral lands our city campus now stands. We would like to also pay our respect to the elders, both past and present, acknowledging them as the traditional custodians of knowledge for this land. So the UTS Animalogic Academy, what is it and what do we do? Uh, well, we're a collaboration between UTS and Animalogic, um, an animation company here in Sydney, the, probably the biggest in Australia. I'm sure most of you have heard about it. And what we do is we try to train people up to get people ready for industry, to refill that junior market uh, in, in the country. And also to get people ready, not just for companies here in Australia, but internationally as well. Uh, luckily enough, right now, uh, there's a real boom in animation in Australia. Um, you know, the recent situation of COVID had a lot to do with that as well, because animation was one of the only bits of content that could be made remotely. But not just due to that, we've had opening of, um, you know, ILM has opened here in Sydney. Animal Logic has a lot of work on its slate, so does Flying Bark. Uh, all the big studios have a lot of work happening at the moment, and they're in desperate need of, uh, of locals to fill those positions um, here in Sydney or here around Australia, really, really. So it's, um, it's a great time to get started and it's a great time for the industry. All right, the Master of Animation and Visualization or the MAV, as you'll hear us talk about it. What is that? It's a accelerated master's degree. And when I say accelerated, what I mean is it's a one year accelerated master's. Most master's degrees tend to go for about a year and a half. We really speed ours up. And what we do is we give our students a look at what it's like in industry. So we set up our degree um, and our studio to replicate the industry. So it's nine to five, five days a week. And we use the same tools, pipeline and processes as you would uh, if you're in industry, if you're at Animalogic or ILM or one of those companies. So, you know, dailies in the morning, rounds in the afternoon, we're using the same software and the same tools. And so that when students uh, leave our, you know, graduate, they can hit the ground running, get into any of these kind of companies and, and, and kind of find it an easy transition. Because previously in the past, um, industries discovered or found out that juniors entering these roles were really struggling. And so uh, the MAV was created as a way to address that. So as you can see, it's a pretty fun kind of, I know it looks pretty dark there. We don't have the lights off all the time. Um, but it is a fun kind of immersive studio experience and it is very similar to what you find in those companies. And also it is taught by industry professionals. Yeah, we get to talk ourselves up a bit, um, but here are some of the fun movies that we've worked on. Actually, um, Chris French, uh, a lighting and technical lead, who just joined us recently, hasn't had a chance to put his movies on here yet either, and so there'll be a whole lot more. Uh, but we all have, you know, decades of experience between us. We've been in the industry, industry for a long time and um, have worked on some really fun projects. So what we're really about is bringing that experience to, um, you know, to the next generation of digital artists. Okay, I'll just go over this really quickly. The year is broken up into three studios or three trimesters. In Studio One, the students get together and pitch and work on a, on a short film. So they come up with the idea, uh, they, they work on 
developing the, the story, the characters, the, the environment, the colours, you name it, uh, in the same way as you would on a pipeline at a main studio. In a studio two, it's called the Emerging Technology Studio or, or Collaboration Studio using an Emerging Technology Project, where the students are broken up into groups of about five or six, and each of them go off to pitch an idea using emer emerging technology that could be Unreal, Absinthe, Unity, um, you know, deep fake, virtual production, you name it. And then at the end of Studio Two, they pitch their idea to a panel of industry experts, and a winner is chosen to move on into Studio Three. Then in Studio Three, we finish both projects. We finish the short film, and we further develop the emerging technology project from Studio Two. Um, yeah, it's a it's a lot of fun, and it's an intense Studio Three. That's where we are at the moment. But you know, yeah, we love it. Um, all right. Uh, cast your eye over here. There are some of the studios that our graduates are currently working at, um, a lot of them, and not just in Australia, but around the world as well. Uh, we do maintain a close relationship with these studios. We're constantly in contact with them. We have guest speakers from each of these studios come and talk to our students throughout the year. Uh, we also, they also come to us when they're looking for people as well. And we, we like to try and find positions and we work with the students at the end of the year in helping them find work. Uh, a few of our achievements. So we're ranked in the top 10 schools in the world by the rookies. Uh, we've won awards at SAGRAF and the rookies in AEAF. And over 90% of our graduates find work in the industry within six months. And I think a lot of that has to do with how we practice and how we replicate the industry. So our, our graduates are ready to work from day one and know what to do. So what I might do here is, oh no, it's one more slide. So. What we're doing at the moment um, is trying to find students who want to specialise in these departments. So a point of difference between us and a lot of other kind of uh, educational facilities out there is that we really design our course about creating and teaching specialists, not generalists. Uh, so by now, because we're a master's degree, most people should know what they want to do. And what we do is we take your skill set and we elevate you to an industry standard. So when people apply, and we'd really like this for anyone who does want to apply to us as well, is hopefully you know what you want to do and you apply for a position in one of these departments. So is it art design, is it previous and layout, modeling, surfacing, rigging, map painting, and so on. There are some departments that naturally kind of work well together and some students do touch two of them together or, or, or work in two, like you know, modeling and surfacing or comp and lighting. Uh, but there are some departments that really just need 100% sort of dedication throughout the year, like visual effects being one of them, animation being another one as well. Uh, you really have to kind of commit to them throughout the year because the people you're working, you're competing against are doing that. So what I'm going to do here is stop sharing my screen. Okay, we're back to us. All right, uh, Chris Dillon, so look, we're, we'll go over the, um, we'll go over each one of the different departments in a second. But before we get to that, like just as a general rule, like what would you guys say is like the top things to keep in mind when sort of applying or putting together your portfolio and reel for, for industry? You can go. <laughs> <He's> <laughs> gonna take it. I was going to go. I was <laughs> going to say, I think your showreel doesn't have to be long. It just has to be really good. Like if you've got three really good things, that's all you need. Um, Chances are whoever's watching it is going to be short on time and they're probably not going to get past 30 seconds anyway. So yeah. um, just put the three very best things on there. That could be enough. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. totally. Um, I guess my, for, for applicants for the MAV, my sort of main thing to keep in mind would be that we're not looking for you to be already awesome. Like, mm -hmm. you know, we, we're really looking for potential. Um, so it's, you know, you, you might think, and, and, and for what Chris was saying as well, like if you've got one thing to show us, that, that can be enough, you know. Um, but like, yeah, we, we're kind of just looking for like, okay, does this person, you know, have, you know, sort of the raw materials that we need to be able to kind of shape them in the right direction to get them ready for industry. So I'd say that's probably my first point. Yeah, um, totally. Yeah. Because there's, there's some people, and we've heard from people in the past who've looked at the work that we've done at the academy, and, and obviously what we're showing on there on our socials and everything is the finished product. You know, it's that 
it's that um, kind of insta life kind of syndrome and, and, and what it comes down to is almost that imposter syndrome, you know, that people don't think they're good enough to get in when what they're doing is they're seeing the work at the very end, right? And they're not seeing the work at the, that the people have done to get in at, at the beginning, right? So, um, yeah, you're right, Dylan. What we'll, we'll show that to everyone t- tonight as well, um, some examples of previous work and past work. Um, but just really want to highlight that that what Dylan said is 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 right. That we re- we're just looking for potential, passion. People are interested in their kind of their one kind of skill set, and and it's not about being you know it's not about being an expert in it because if you were an expert you wouldn't need us you know you you could go out and find work straight away. The point is we're just looking for people who have you know enthusiasm and have a bit of potential in their real that and something we can work with because then we'll, you know, generate that work over the course of the year. Yeah. And I think like um, like that list that you were showing before in the, in the slideshow is good as well because I think that's something, you know, like you, we've always been saying that we're really concentrating on, on making, you know, creating generalists. I'm sorry, yeah, specialists, not generalists. <laughs> so, I mean, generally, you know, for if you're coming into a master's, you've either had a little bit of experience, you know, either with previous study or maybe with some work experience and stuff like that. And so we're hoping that you've kind of at least had enough ex- experience to kind of have a good idea of the kinds of things you like in 3D. You maybe, you know, don't know exactly what you want to do, but if at least you have some kind of idea of like, I think I like doing character animation, or I think, you know, I like lighting and stuff like that. Um, that as well will really help us to kind of work with you to kind of work out what is the exact role that you want to do. And if that's the case, as far as real is concerned, put anything that kind of shows off how like the stuff that you can do in that role up the front. Yeah. You know, yep. that's, and that goes for like all reels. You want your best stuff. Like um, we were saying before with best stuff up the front, but also the most applicable stuff up the front, put some other stuff on there as well. If you've got other, you know, things that maybe aren't quite as relevant, but yep. you know, having that sort of the really specialized stuff that you all really want to concentrate up the front is really cool as well. Definitely. Um, I'm just going to remind, sorry, I forgot to say this at the beginning, everyone, but um, there's a little Q&A button at the bottom. Um, please, you know, start. you can start asking questions in there as we go. And there's a cool little feature too, that if you see a question that someone else has asked and you, and you think it's a good one, you can give it a thumbs up. And the uh, questions with the most thumbs up rise to the top. So we will ask, answer them, um, you know, first as we, as we get to them. Um, just a point as well about portfolios because um, uh, there are two other departments that don't really sort of have a visual portfolio. So what do you do about them? And they're sort of production and the technical roles. Um, I might talk about production and then Chris, you can do the technical one. That's cool. Um, so production, people want to get into production. It's really more about the interview process because um, production is being a people person. It's being organized. It's being structured. It's being able to understand um, you know, schedules, timelines, deadlines, you name it. And, and so it is a little bit more about communication. Uh, it's being able to kind of talk to people, listen to people, listening is a big one. And, and, you know, not really being flustered under pressure and stress. Um, and so what should you do if you want to get into production and want to apply? Well, it's, it's really just you just name that on the application process and you don't have to hand in a portfolio, that's fine. Uh, we'll then jump straight to the kind of interview part so we can we can talk to you from there. Uh, Chris, what about technical roles? What should people do for that? Uh, well, yeah, with technical roles, I think either you, you can't really show anything. It's not like you've got a visual show reel, but technical roles often involve sort of scripting. Um, mm-hmm. So if you have scripts that you can show that they can run, you know, if it's inside of Maya or if it's a Python script that does a renaming function or something on a set of folders, you know, that's really useful because it shows that you don't understand scripting and hmm. um, all those kinds of things. Um, the big thing that we're kind of really looking for if you want to go into a technical role is problem solving skills. Um, problem solving is, that's 90% of the job, I think, sometimes when you're in those TD roles. The One of the things we're dealing with, have been dealing with at the moment here is we have a character and her hair doesn't want to render. It turns up in the in the scene, but it doesn't want to render. And so that's what we go and fix. We go and figure out why that's not working. Um, so problem solving, if you can script, that's good. Um, I think they're the two major things. And on what Alex said, you know, it's it's stressful. It's like this hair's not rendering. We need to send these renders out tonight. How are you going to deal with that stress? Um, hmm. 
that's a really important skill as well, you know, being able to manage that yourself. So I think they're the three things for me. Yeah, great. Great. Um, I'm going to add one more thing, uh, and that is um, just keep in mind, like Dylan was saying, but just to reiterate it, keep in mind the role that you're applying for and make sure that you have content on your real or portfolio that reflects that role. So if you're applying for a, um, you know, animation role and all you're showing is models or, or you know, a rig, then that really doesn't give us anything to work with. Um, you know, we do have some tests that we kind of run through people sometimes, but generally it's nice to see just even a little bit of, of the skill set of, of what you want to apply for because, you know, that can help us judge your, your sort of ability from there. Um, cool. All right. So what I might do, how about we show some examples? I might share my screen again and I'll show some examples of a modeling reel and an animation reel. So here we go. These are students from last year who have all given us uh, permission to, to show. Um, all right, so Jason. Jason uh, loved cartoons. He loved, loved Disney work. He was a big sort of fan of Disney. Uh, this was his reel. Um, uh, he didn't, I don't believe he did everything in it, but it was mostly modeling. So he wanted to come in as a modeler. And uh, this was actually some assets he modeled for a VR project. And what I'm going to do, I'm just going to jump forward because we don't necessarily need to see this. But what was interesting halfway through were these characters. So he had put through a portfolio of all these different um, characters that he had modelled. So he'd modelled all these. And, you know, they need work. They're not amazing. Um, uh, there's, definitely, there's definitely things that need to be improved on there. They're all pretty, they're a bit low poly. They're all a bit sort of, you know, scary eyes and weird sort of muscles and legs and proportions uh, but that's kind of that's kind of not the point the point was that there is potential here we, you know there's someone who is a hundred percent kind of enthusiastic and loves modeling they love character modeling uh, Jason just you know modeled all the time whenever he got a chance he was just working on it you know constantly and um, and it was something that he was really passionate about so we looked at this and we saw the different models that he made and thought yeah fantastic we can absolutely work with this person because they know what they want to do. They've done, um, you know, quite a lot. And that's the other thing as well. There was variety there. There was these models, but he'd also worked on these kind of environments as well and tried different sort of things. He'd worked on modeling for real time. Um, and so it was really great to see, you know, these things, even though they're not perfect, even though it's not great, you know, he put the effort in and, and, and the second, you know, when we, when we get people to apply to the MAV, there are really sort of three aspects that we look for. One of them is, you know, your past sort of educational qualifications. Uh, then it's a portfolio and real. And the third part is the interview. And so the interview is really where we gauge people's enthusiasm and, and willingness to learn, you know. If, and that is, you know, we gauge whether or not someone, you know, is really kind of serious about doing this. Because a lot of it is about, you know, if, if the reel isn't great, but then we talk to someone, they say, you know, look, I know, I get it, but I just, I want to, you know, I'm passionate about this and it's all I want to do, then that's great. That's something we can, um, that's something we can work with. And then that was Jason at the beginning. And then this is, was his reel at the end of the year. And, um, you know, he kept, he kept working on his Disney princesses throughout the year. Um, but, you know, we worked on them together, even though they didn't have any, anything to do with our main project, he was working on these on his Fridays because our Fridays are a self-learning Friday where people can work on their own projects. And instead of doing anything that wasn't related to his skill set, he kept working and practicing and working and practicing, but we worked on them together. We showed them to people. We kind of practiced and looked at anatomy together as well. And, you know, as you can see, he, you know, he vastly improved from from his last reel to where he is now. Now, the other thing that he did as well, these are all characters, but then, as you'll see, he's got props. He's got assets, props, vehicles, and organic materials as well. So he bought, modeled a lot of the sort of plants and trees for our short film. And this is the reel that got him a job straight away in industry because uh, the modeling supervisor saw this and saw that he had variety. He had a range of work. His topology was clean on his models and he'd learned quite a lot on, on, you know, how to put this together. And it was really, you know, it was just really impressive to see how much he had moved forward over the, over the course of the year. Um, so I'll just quickly show an animation reel. So this was Marina's. 
um, she put herself down as a generalist because she didn't have a, a range of different kind of skill sets over, you know, that she'd been using, a bit of lighting. She did a little bit of rigging stuff. Um, and th this was all good. But really, you know, what we're looking at is here, I'm going to show this specifically, her animation. So look, this dragon, it's a bit, you know, it's a bit floaty. It's a bit hokey. She didn't model or rig it, you know, that was just, you know, someone else, but she'd um, animated the dragon. It's a bit weird, you know, and this jump, it's a bit floaty, but definitely enough there to work with, you know, someone who understands, understands the physics, you know, and then some acting stuff. Again, as well, this was enough for us to kind of look at her reel and say, yeah, she's, you know, really wants to do animation, has spent the time doing this definitely and has, um, as, you know, dedicated in, in animation. Even though it's, you know, there's still stuff that can be fixed there and worked on. So then I'm going to just show her reel after where she got to. And Marina really developed well over the years she's um she got a job uh she got a job at flying bark uh in animation uh then an animal uh, based off the back of this reel that she you know that she worked on her shots so she worked on her shots for the short film but then again you know on her fridays she kept working on her own work so this is what i wanted to show if it worked oh no don't do this now <laughs> Always the technical problems, right? When you're doing this on a webinar. Yeah, I'm going to open that again. Sorry, everyone. Okay, if I just let this play through, because Marina did another dragon shot that we worked on together. And as you'll see, it's um, you know, a huge improvement on the one that she did at the beginning of the year. Come on, where are we, dragon shot? Here we go. So people keep looking at, you know, the stuff that we've done at the end of the year and think that, uh, you know, that their skill set or ability isn't to that level. Um, but that's only because we've been pushing them there and the three leads have been working with these artists uh, across the year to get them to that level. And then what most people don't realise is that at the beginning, at the beginning of the year, their work was, you know, was much, much simpler, you know, much, much different than it, than it was, you know, where we got it to the end because we've been teaching them all these basic skill sets in this, in this area, in their chosen kind of, in their chosen direction. Right, I'm going to stop sharing that now, and I might pass over to you, Dylan, if you want to talk about yeah, some cool. of the effect stuff. Yeah, no worries. Um, all right, let me try and share my screen here. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm I'm sort of the effects lead. So effects being, you know, simulations, um, light, uh, fire, kind of smoke, you know, things like that explosions, destruction. Um, so the, you know, these kind of things can be sometimes, I mean, especially with uh, the fact that Houdini is kind of the main software that we teach and that's used in the industry. Um, not a lot of people have had, a bit, had exposure to uh, Houdini before they come to us. Um, so I'll show you a couple of different examples across that sort of spectrum of people who have varying levels of, of experience with it before, uh, before they apply it to us. So this first one here is from Nathan Barrett. And he, as you can see, he's done some simulation stuff before. So, um, you know, I look at this and, um, you know, again, looking for potential. I mean, he's got a fair bit of different kind of effects going on in this uh, little sort of shot here. Um, you know, so he's sort of had a good kind of broad uh, knowledge of Houdini already um, working on, you know, this little project. So things like the, the deformation of the couch um, was all done by him as well in Houdini, uh, you know, and then all your standard kind of simulation uh, sort of stuff uh, like that. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, again, there's lots of kind of, I don't know, refinement and technical issues and things like that that kind of need to be sort of sorted out in something like this. 
Um, but, you know, the, the bare bones is, is definitely there um, as far as, you know, his, his knowledge of Houdini is concerned. Um, and so then this is his reel at, when he finished, um, when he finished the map. So he did a bunch of stuff like this trail um, underneath the thylacine, um, which is a really kind of pretty cool, unique sort of effect. Um, he worked on all of this tree fire here, which you'll see in the next one. Um, so, for instance, yeah, so these, these uh, had a setup here for all of these different kind of trees that you could just put into all the shots. And then, of course, some of his Friday stuff, Friday work here, um, you know, he did like this ghost rider effect, which is pretty cool, um, you know, and some other kind of uh, things like this, you know, working on other sort of things. Like, for instance, in our film, there wasn't any kind of water effect. So he went and sort of started kind of learning some of that as well on the, on the Learning Fridays. Um, yeah, obviously a lot of fire and so on. Um, so that one's cool. Um, I might just do how much time we got. I'll oh, so, so someone, you got time, mate. Um, you can, yeah, you can you do three. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. Yeah, go for it. Cool. All right. Um, so Levi, let me show you this one. Um, yeah, so Levi, obviously he had started doing a little bit of uh, Houdini, um, but this is fairly sort of simple um, effects here. But what I see here when I'm looking at this reel is, you know, he's thought about uh, attention to detail and stuff here. Like it's not just, um, you know, sparks sort of flying out as far as like one little kind of line. He's actually done those little kind of spiky things on the end that you get on those sparks, um, you know, and uh, stuff like that. So that's, you know, again, an attribute, definitely a huge attribute for someone wanting to do effects is, is that real kind of OCD attention to detail. Um, so that's sort of one thing I'm kind of looking for uh, in effects reels or in anyone who wants to do effects. Um, and so then this is Levi's reel afterwards. Um, some pretty cool stuff here for destruction. He's got some metal thing. He's got some cool kind of, you know, technical breakdown here as well. Um, you know, and then here's some of his work on, um, on the spirit film was, um, this one in particular is awesome. Like this thylacine revealing effect. Um, you know, and he worked on a lot of stuff with the trees as well to add branches and stuff in a procedural manner. So, you know, all really cool stuff there. Um, and then we have Heath. And so Heath came to us with a, you know, generalist showreel. So this is, you know, this is all Maya. There's no Houdini in here whatsoever. But like when I'm looking at this, I'm, I'm seeing, okay, again, attention to detail. Um, you know, he's these a lot of these camera tracks. I've, he's done all the camera tracking and stuff on these, um, so you know they all look rock solid. Um, and camera tracking requires, you know, a lot of uh, some of the same kind of um, sort of skills and and that that you need for effects. Like you need to have, um, you know, sort of an eye, a good eye. Um, like a creative eye, a good eye for detail and a good sort of technical foundation in 3D. So, um, and then when Heath finished, this was his reel. And so, yeah, I think this was another personal project of his that he was working on. Um, and then he, Heath actually did all of this fire, um, spirit fire stuff, um, which is, you know, it's crazy considering like, you know, what you saw his reel was at the beginning, there was no effects in it whatsoever. And then he's come up with all of this stuff. So, um, you know, if you're, again, you're look, like looking at your thing, you know, wanting to do effects and stuff like that. And you're like, oh, I don't have any effects. I don't really know any uh, Houdini and stuff like that. You can still, you know, if you've got the right qualities, if you kind of have the right sort of technical know-how and uh, ability and I guess potential is the main thing. Um, we can definitely sort of, um, you know, help you kind of push you in the right direction. Um, yeah, and so, and especially also for next year, um, we are having, we're changing, modifying the Houdini um, way we teach Houdini next year, um, putting a lot more um, 
sort of a bit more em emphasis into it. We have some special specialised Houdini projects um, that we're working on with the effects students for next year. So uh, really looking forward to being able to do all that. Right. Hey, so Dylan, if for people mm. who might not have had a chance to kind of play around with Houdini that much, but they're mm. really just passionate about effects, you still think they can apply? Yes, absolutely. I mean, um, you know, uh, Houdini, they have a, on the side effects site, they have a free Houdini version you can uh, download. Um, mm. But yeah, I mean, I, I just, I would say if, if that sort of stuff appeals to you and you've had obviously some 3D experience, um, definitely hit us up and you know, have a talk to us and we can sort of, you know, have a look at, at, what, at your work and where you're at at the moment and sort of, you know, offer some guidance, um, you know, as to how you could get into the effects in the, um, yeah, department. Great. Cool. Thanks, mate. Uh, hey, Chris, so lighting and comp. Yep. I think just off the back of Dylan first, like, I think that's a good point. It's like, we're always happy to talk to you, like, show us what you've got and, you know, where we will tell you where we think you're at on the journey mm. um yeah. so you know hit us up like we're we're happy to chat we love to chat to people um so i think that's a really important point to mention so absolutely well, look we show it at the end everyone and i will show it again but there's a there's a chance where you can book a one-on-one -on -one with us if you want to have if you're not sure and you want to go run over some things with us and you can book in a 15 minute chat so if any of this is you're not quite sure like you said just just book that book that in and, and we're happy to have a talk to you about it yeah Oh, all right, so do, do, do. all right. Um, so I am going to show uh, Sam's reel. Um, you can see here she's sort of a um, bit of doing everything: modeling, texturing, lighting, shading. Um, that's a really cool thing. You can see here she's also sort of used some Render Man and some Arnold, which is nice because different VFX studios render with different renderers. Um, so I always like to see, um, you know, if you've got experience with different renderers, it doesn't really matter um, because uh, once you understand the concepts of lighting and rendering, they're very transferable. Um, but this is the bit at the end, which is the bit that I really like is um, we just sort of see her layering up all the different lights in the scene. Um, and what we've got is it's cartoony. Yeah, but I'm just going to go back and pause on that one. Um, you know, is a cartoony, yeah, but like, it's cool. Like, there's a lot, there's a nice composition to that scene. Um, and as lighters, we are digital cinematographers. Um, so understanding how to draw the viewer's eye into a shot, make them look where you want them to look, you know, I can see elements of that in this. Um, and so like the others have been talking about, there's something to work with, um, which is really good. And the fact that she sort of understands the different components of the shot like the different lights and starting to layer them up that's um that's also really good to see um and this one you know this is sort of some more different things i think is animation which um you know it's nice to show that she's tried other things as well because i think it's good to understand all parts of the pipeline um as a lighting and comp as we are uh, at the end of the pipeline so it's good to understand the things that um, the challenges that are facing other departments. Um, this is her reel at the end of the year. Um, this is a surfacing and comp reel. Um, it's pretty cool. Um, you know, you've got that jade kind of look. It's been lit uh, in Katana with Random Man. This is the group project. Uh, this is um, Spirit. Really nice lighting. Um, it's consistent across the board. You can see it's nice that she's got at the top. She's told you what she's done. She's done the light rig. She's also done the lighting and just composited the shot. Uh, really important if you're going into like an animated feature kind of career that you can comp your own shots. Here we can see a breakdown, which is really nice. I can see, okay, that's the tree for her compositing uh, inside of Nuke for this. Um, she gets it. That's good. Um, and even if you're working in live action, you have to sort of do a temporary comp, we call them bash comps, to show it daily. So understanding how to comp is good. And this is nice, I like this because um, this is the kind of work that juniors do. They're doing props and assets and things like that. And so we can see that she's, from a surfacing point of view, can do all those things that um, is expected of a junior. Um, 
Oops. I'm going to just stop sharing for one sec. Where's it gone? There it goes. Um, so as a, as a lighting artist and a compositing artist, what we're looking for is an understanding of light. And I think that, that showreel, the, the before, the before showreel at the start showed that she understood that. Um, and then you can see there's proof over the years she's really developed that skill and um, spent that whole time really just working and developing it. Um, so that's what I want to see, I guess, from lighting compositors. There's, um, because lighting is sort of, uh, it's about light, photography is something that um, I also encourage anybody who wants to go into lighting and comp to be doing, like walking around, with, I mean, we all have cameras, we've got phones. So taking photos all the time, understanding what makes something interesting. Um, so that's kind of our challenge. Um, so I think that's what I want to see from lighting and comp people. Um, cool. There's also an element of problem solving. So there's lots of that, which kind of leads into those technical roles. Often people at the back end of the pipeline, which is effects, lighting, comp, um, often have to be problem solvers. And so you've got those people, there's TDs for those departments, but you also have pipeline TDs who are in there making tools to help artists just focus all their time on artistry. Um, and um, you have TDs in departments who are helping those departments with tools and problem solving, figuring out why hair doesn't render and all these things. Um, so if you've got a computer science background and you're like, oh, I'm going to go work in a bank, you can go work in a bank. That's cool. Um, <laughs> I would find that boring. You know, you can also take those skills and come and work in the film industry because there's a real shortage, I think, of technical people at the moment who can come and solve these problems. And if you've got some artistic ability as well, if you combine those two, that's a really powerful skill set that, Will take you a long way um, so that's kind of what i'm looking for if i'm looking at someone in a technical role is can you problem solve can you um, work well under pressure there's no real show real like we sort of said before for that it's more of a personality thing but if you can prove that you can code show some examples of your code working um, or projects that you've worked on you know at a software company or anything else then that's really good um, Oh, and what about, um, same kind of question, I guess, Chris. So what about people who obviously never use Katana, never use Render Man, you know, Glimpse, or the, you know, those kind of top-end software, rendering software and, and, and lighting softwares out there, does that matter? Not really. I, at Fuel, I used a renderer called Mental Ray for my entire career. Yep. And then when I went to Method, it was Render Man and Katana, and I'd never used mm -hmm. either of them. But, uh, you know, I was up to speed pretty quickly because a renderer, you know, they, they have similar concepts. Yeah. Um, you know, the great thing if you want to come to the Mav is we'll teach you Katana. Um, mm. Katana is probably the thing that scares people, I guess, because it's new and they don't understand and it's a different way of lighting, but uh, it's a really powerful way of lighting that will actually free you up and give you more time to focus on the lighting and the art as opposed to the technical side of like, oh, this isn't rendering, you know. Like, so yeah. you don't need to know Katana. I will teach you Katana. <laughs> I look, I mean, that, that, I think that goes for every department, right? I mean, that's the thing is that at the end of the day, it's about the fundamentals, not the software, right? Yeah. And so if you, if you understand contrast, light, perspective, shade, color, you know, those basic principles, then you can apply that to any software because the software can be taught, right? And it's the same with animation or effects or, you know, I mean, what are the fundamentals for effects, Dylan? Is it physics and a few some techniques yeah. or yeah i guess i mean yeah like i said what i was kind of looking for is is really it's it's uh, eye for detail mm. um and a, a bit of a technical mind because there is a lot of problems problem solving um in effects and you know just and even it, you know an eye, a bit of an eye for motion i guess as well um you know those are the kind of things i'm sort of looking for yeah um, great and right, I think yeah i mean oh sorry passion yeah. just be passionate mm. Yeah. Like, yes. you're going to spend a lot of time doing this. You really want to love it and be passionate about it and be like, you want to get up yeah. and you want to go, yeah, cool, I'm going to do this today. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. definitely. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's uh, why this, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, was gonna, I was just going to also say, like, just to add to that, uh, you, you have to love learning to get into this industry. Like, I'd say that's, up, uh, you know, passion and loving learning because things yeah. are always changing. There's new versions of software coming out. You have to like, keep your knowledge up to date and that, like, never ends your whole career. So yeah, that's another thing that you need to kind of cultivate yeah. as well. 
it's every six months there's a major change or a major leap mm -hmm. in this industry and that's yeah. kind of what's really amazing about it is you you are forced to kind of continually be on the cutting edge and i personally love that you know mm. don't you that's don't get stale you're not stuck exciting. doing the same thing yeah you're not yeah. doing the same thing every day it's yeah. cool <laughs> uh awesome thanks guys and hey um sam is now working at animal logic as a lighter on one of their animated feature films so off yes. the back of that reel as well it's pretty impressive yeah um, so look, just to, just to, because we are going to go to questions, um, in a second, um, but just to re reiterate to everyone, you know, don't that whole imposter syndrome of, of looking at some of this stuff and thinking that, man, that's something I really want to do, but, um, but I'm not there yet, or I haven't got the skills yet. Please do apply anyway. You know, I, I think you'd be surprised at, at, at what we consider the level of potential, you know, and what we are looking for. And you've heard it from all of us at the moment now is that we're looking for enthusiasm and passion, you know, over a high skill set. You know, um, that's really kind of because that's something that we can work with and that's going to do you well once you get in the industry as well. So if in doubt, uh, apply. Right. Don't don't don't. It's, there's no point kind of holding back and waiting um, at this point because that's just you know, you might be doing yourself a disservice and you're probably better than you think you are. And I think that's of all of us, right? We're all better than we think we are because, you know, we're our own worst critic. Um, but, yeah, so, so get it in front of us as soon as you can. Key top points for your portfolios or reels. Include only your best work. Keep it brief. There's no need to do a 10-minute show reel. You know, the duration doesn't matter that much. Um, have work that's relevant to the role that you're applying for unless you want to kind of enhance it like we are just talking about with some fundamental work. Give credit as needed. Look at the big one. If, if you've got kind of like some amazing scene with a character running through an environment, there's explosions going off, just tell us what you did in there just so we understand. And also you don't want to steal other people's work. <laughs> We've got turned down the sound. Um, look, I think just take that as a general kind of don't make it too loud. You know, that's all. Don't make it too crazy. Awesome. All right. So here's the application process. Um, domestic students um, reg register online at UTS to submit an online application. Um, international as well. You can find out the information for both of them at the link below, the animalogicacademy.uts.edu.au then FAC to get more information. Now your application has to include a portfolio, a personal statement of why you want to join the academy, a CV, and your academic record and documentation of your industry experience. Now, for people who are still studying, um, don't worry, you can still apply, right? Uh, uh, we've had that question come up before and people worried about, wait a second, I don't graduate till the end of this year, but, you know, applications close, you know, at, on the 31st of, you know, this month and what do I do? Don't worry, you can still apply and you can get a conditional offer. Obviously, it's dependent on whether or not you pass your current degree. Um, but don't feel like you can't apply just because you're currently studying. Um, there are the application dates. Now, you can get in touch with us through that through the, our website to do a one-on-one -on -one with any of us, you know, all of us, to have a chat about if you have any other questions about what we just spoke about, or you can just email through and um, we can answer your questions by email as well um, if you don't want to just, you know, do the whole sort of Zoom thing too. Um, please follow us on socials uh, because we're always posting work there from the students and updates and really fun things about what we're, you know, what we're doing. So if you're interested in, in attending the course, I recommend you do that just so you can get a better sense of what we do.